children got. Um, but, you know, and the challenge is real. The challenge is real. Maintaining that infrastructure, managing those finite budget budgets and meeting those public expectations. And that's a, that's a challenge on the national level. And then when you take a look at the local, regional and state level, um, the challenge is expanded. You know, now you have media just, you know, sharing all kinds of data points, um, setting expectations for the public that are not necessarily funded. Some of that, you know, those data points don't have context. And now you have local communities, leaders and staff that are really challenged with how do they manage the assets and how do they, um, you know, make good decisions around spending the public funds. And they're so opening we have an idea. One. That's they're our job here today. Is to some, some creative solutions. Do it in person on, next time. Um, some creative solutions on how to um, come, you know, to deal with this problem. I'll let Aaron pop to the next slide. Some innovative approaches to take asset management past sort of that technical challenge. And of course, um, we think it's all about bringing some planners to the table. But um, we have some real, you know, validity to that today, and we'll share you some. We'll share some case studies that show that. But as planners, we can um, really bring in sort of that public perspective and understand the goals and objectives of the community, and how do we integrate those into um, strategic, strategic decision making tools. Um, and then we can take that and create visuals that not only tell the story for how and why, but make it easy for um, the public to understand and for the local leaders um, to make decisions and share those decisions um, across the board. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Great, thanks Denise. Uh, so again, my name is Aaron Sussman with Bohin Houston. And so we have a couple of case studies that we want to share with all of you today. And um, before we get into those case studies and some ideas for how we manage transportation assets in a, uh, what we think is an is a innovative or creative way, um, in a particularly useful way, we wanna talk a little bit more about the challenges that we need to respond to. So it's not just that the infrastructure is in um, poor conditions in some cases or that, um, or that budgets are finite, which obviously we know about, but there's also just the reality that uh, there's demands for transparency in terms of how money is spent. There's public expectations that infrastructure be maintained to a high standard. And then there's the challenge as staff at agencies that you're expected to sort of make everybody happy, uh, uh, make the elected officials happy to ensure that roads in their districts are, are in good condition to respond to public needs and requests. Um, and to again, do so with finite budgets. So the um, question then becomes, how do you respond to all of those needs in a way that's coherent and objective and transparent? And on top of that, we are also responding to the fact that uh, data collection and data management is an ongoing challenge. So a lot of agencies um, have the capacity to um, collect pavement and bridge conditions on a recurring basis, but not all of them do. Um, there's uh, differences among agencies in terms of the, the quality and the extent of data that's available too, whether you've got data related to the year of construction, previous or ongoing maintenance efforts. Uh, so we don't always know a lot about the current conditions that facilities are in. And then when we do have data, it's also a challenge to think about, is it data at a point in time or do we have good longitudinal data and we're tracking sort of the trajectory of, of infrastructure conditions? And do we know um, what, again, our long-term needs are likely to be and, and how do we best respond to those types of conditions? So our thought is, you know, asset management and maintaining infrastructure, it's obviously a technical challenge, but it's also a decision-making challenge. And it's also sort of a data management challenge. So we've got a couple of case studies that we wanted to talk through today that utilize web-based tools, um, that utilize prioritization processes, that take the condition, uh, existing conditions information, that identify areas of need. And then we use those tools and those materials to help understand uh, both the public decision makers and, and give staff the, the resources they need to make those decisions um, to, to, to base those decisions on the magnitude of benefits. And then um, I, as much as anything to then make that information and that decision making available in a public facing way so that there's a, uh, a logic behind the, 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 the decisions the staff makes. And then there's also sort of a rationale for, um, for prioritizing some roads over others, because again, we've got those constraints of public, of finite public resources. So one of the contributions that we can make as well as, as planners in this field or thinking about things in terms of strategic decision making is that there's not a one size fits all approach when it comes to, again, taking that information about 
transportation infrastructure conditions and then turning that into a decision making tool. So one of the things that we've um, noted in our work is the benefit of identifying again the needs and conducting the needs assessments, but then linking the project selection and prioritization to agency goals and objectives, taking those transportation plans or comprehensive plans that sometimes as transportation professionals, we're not always sure what to do with, um, but to utilize those documents to develop, um, to develop uh, evaluation criteria. And uh, one of the points that we wanna emphasize through our case studies today is that we definitely need to look for different criteria for different contexts. So what makes sense um, in Las Cruces may not make sense in um, Colfax County or something like that. And then the other um, aspect is just the reality that the criteria that we can use for decision-making depend on available data. So we'd always like to have more and better data, but we need to both turn that data into something that's useful and coherent, uh, but also um, be able to sort of operationalize that data into something that we can measure. So we have a couple of case studies um, that we wanted to share with you on um, asset management plans and supporting web tools that we've developed uh, for Sandoval County and for New Mexico State University. So I'm going to speak about the Sandoval County Transportation Asset Management Plan and web tool. And in a few minutes, I will turn it over to Curtis Sanders to talk about the NMSU plan. So um, first, as I mentioned, let me talk about the Sandoval County Transportation Asset Management Plan and give you a little bit of a preview to the web tool that um, we'll show um, in, a, in a few slides uh, in a few minutes. But first, let me talk about sort of the genesis of this project. So um, we were approached by Sandoval County with this need to improve their decision-making in public works and to think about how they spend their resources, but also to give, again, as I mentioned earlier, give staff, the support that they need to defend their decision making and make it clear to county commissioners why they're going to prioritize some roads for improvement over others, uh, or to make clear to members of the public why certain roads are likely to be maintained with different levels of frequency than others. And so they uh, wanted to apply this asset management approach, uh, which we can really think of as kind of a strategic approach to maintaining roadways that utilizes um, existing conditions information, desired conditions information, and then um, insights into long-term costs and the life cycles of different roadway facilities and transportation facilities. So we started this effort by building off of the uh, master transportation plan, which was completed in 2013. And that was a planning effort that identified at the time the current transportation conditions. It developed a prioritization process that can be used to evaluate and rank um, individual transportation projects. Um, but it stopped short of um, a more comprehensive asset management approach. And that was actually a recommendation that came out of the master transportation plan. So we wanted to build off of that effort and, and then utilize the, the data, the priorities, um, the goals and objectives that came out of the master transportation plan. And in particular, we wanted to think about how do we take this prioritization process, which was initially designed for evaluating individual roadway projects and sort of broaden the application. So we could apply that same process to any segment of any road across Sandoval County. Um, that obviously meant additional data collection, but it also meant sort of rethinking the prioritization process to some degree so that it could be more flexible and nimble and that you could apply it proactively, not based on what is a project doing, but based on the needs um, and the priorities associated with an individual location. So to build a transportation asset management program for Sandoval County, we needed a couple of things. One was to make sure we've got good baseline data in terms of the Sandoval County Roads Network. Uh, we also wanted to evaluate surface conditions and I'll talk about a, a large scale survey that we did for that effort. And then ultimately we wanted to identify priority roads or priority segments uh, through a prioritization process. And those pieces of information would collectively give Sandoval County the information that they need as a baseline to make decisions about the frequency of maintenance and when to invest in individual roadways. So of course there are opportunities and challenges associated with building this kind of program. Uh, the first challenge is that um, while we did have certain types of data. Um, we didn't have widespread traffic counts data. Sandoval County doesn't have zoning, so we had to rely on um, sort of generalized Mr. Cog land use data sets, but there was a lot of information from the Mid-Region Council of Governments that we could draw from, and we could also just pull from some creative um, approaches in terms of uh, evaluation criteria and thinking about what are the, um, what are the, what constitutes a priority roadway. 
So I'll come back to that in a moment. But the first um, piece of this that we wanted to highlight is a roadway conditions survey that we conducted for every um, publicly accessible mile of road across Sandoval County. And uh, that's not necessarily reasonable for all communities. Um, you can do it through samples or surveys. Um, if you've got good Google Earth data, you can do it from a desktop and at least get some basic conditions information. But we went ahead and drove every publicly accessible mile of road across Sandoval County and assigned a conditions rating to each segment of good, fair, or poor. Um, we developed criteria for different road types, whether it was gravel, um, dirt, or paved. Um, and then along those road, uh, routes that were publicly accessible, we also collected um, an archive of video data that is date stamped and Sandoval County can use to um, compare and contrast conditions over time. So to complement the existing conditions and surface conditions data, we developed this prioritization process and um, a few steps in putting this together. So ultimately, and I'll come back to this again in a few minutes, but we wanted to combine the surface conditions information with a um, road prioritization level and then combine those two features inform um, where roadway improvements could be made. So the steps in developing our prioritization process began with assembling the existing data and then um, developing scoring criteria and thresholds that would give insights into the significance or role of a roadway. And then we ultimately were able to identify a priority tier level, one, two, or three for all roadway segments across the county. And we did that using the evaluation criteria that are indicated on the right side of the screen. So um, surface type, not surface condition, but surface type, uh, paved, gravel, um, dirt roadway, functional classification, observed numbers of crashes, um, if there are bridges and the condition of those bridges, the surrounding land use, uh, population characteristics, both in terms of the magnitude or number of residents, but also the socioeconomic and demographic characteristics. Hi Sarah, this is Sally Reeves. How are you doing? Hey, good. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, we also looked at things like flood risks. So we identified routes that passed through um, FEMA, FEMA designated floodplains. And so that became a useful data set as well to understand um, where routes may be at, um, at greater sort of risk of long-term deterioration. So going back to the roadway conditions survey, again, um, more than 1600 miles of roads were surveyed. Um, what was interesting, if we sort of break that down by road type, and you can see the images at the bottom of different um, different dirt roads is just the sort of variety of, of conditions. Um, the image on the lower right is a road that's barely recognizable at this point. Um, we did a um, among the surveys that we conducted, Curtis and, and a coworker actually got stuck in an arroyo in uh, the Rio Rancho Estates area and had to get towed out of, um, of, of a poorly maintained section of a road passing through a drainage arroyo. Um, but what we observed was um, generally the roads, in, the dirt roads um, are actually in uh, sort of better condition than other road types, uh, partly because it's just sort of the, the ease with which they can be maintained. Um, dirt roads make up about 80% of the Sandoval County network. Paved roads, which um, carry the most traffic and are generally concentrated in certain portions of the county, um, only about 12 or 13% of the um, total miles of roads um, are generally in poorer condition. And, and obviously um, maintaining and, and resurfacing and or even reconstructing paved roads can be a pretty expensive endeavor. So we will think about that in a couple different ways. We can summarize those data for um, for public consumption in ways that are useful. This data can become a point in time that can be used to assess the changing conditions over time. So that's something that we want to emphasize that has a lot of value in terms of um, public um, information sharing and transparency. But then going back again to roadway priorities. So we applied the prioritization process to all road segments. And so again, this is not an overall road score for um, a long uh, roadway corridor, but individual segments. And then based on those criteria that I mentioned, again, things like land use and population density, um, and we assigned a priority level for those roads. And the idea with this priority level is that it's not based on current conditions, it's really based on the role and function of the roadway. And that role or function is not likely to change over time. If it's a high priority road, a tier one roadway, it's likely to maintain, be, it's likely to be a tier one roadway into the future, but the conditions may change over time. And so again, contrasting those features becomes really critical and that can inform the investment decisions. So we decided to not just leave Sandoval County with uh, a static document to, uh, to uh, be sort of a, 
a mirror or sort of an image of those conditions at one point in time, but to create a web tool that could be updated and that could store those um, conditions information and priority tier levels and, and demonstrate improvements or changes over time. So this web tool has basic information um, depicting the roadway network, uh, the location and context, including um, different types of destinations and attractions across the county. Um, but the real key features are things like the surface conditions information. And the idea with this um, web tool, again, is that it's interactive, it's easy to use. It's just kind of a point and click kind of tool. You click on the different tabs, they pull up different information. You click on the roadway segments, it'll tell you the surface condition, as you see in this image on the right, good, fair, or poor, and, and the time at which that data was collected. And it makes this, again, publicly available and easily accessible um, for residents across the county. So the um, most challenging piece long-term for this type of web tool is gonna to be updating surface conditions over time, but um, we do have the capacity to bring that information into a web tool like this. You can point and click on a segment, um, check the conditions, the time or the, the date at which the information was collected. Um, and then you can see, zoom in different levels and, and where we see roads in, in uh, different condition levels. So what you're seeing in the image on the left are across Northwest Sandoval County um, in the Rio Rancho Estates area. A lot of roads have that um, reddish color indicating that they're in the poorest conditions. Um, and then um, another example from the Placitas area as well. So we can contrast those surface conditions against the priority tier data. And again, the idea here is that um, the priority tiers are not likely to change significantly over time, um, but that set of considerations, priority tier level plus surface conditions, that's the real key in terms of informing where um, proactive um, uh, improvements could be targeted, for example. So in each of these maps, um, red is a, is a tier one roadway, the highest priority route, um, tier two is in yellow, and then tier three is in green. So for example, you see a lot of the roads in Rio Rancho estates um, to the west of Rio Rancho that are owned and maintained by the county, um, but there's not much activity out there. Many of those routes are um, tier three facilities um, for now. If um, more development were to take place in that area, then um, those priority tier levels could be updated. So just to close out, um, the, the um, couple of things we wanted to emphasize about the Sandoval County Transportation Asset Management Plan that goes along with the web tool. So, um, you know, this is obviously a point in time document. Anytime you build, you produce a static document, but it's really meant to be a methodology document that um, can be used to support ongoing application because it indicates the process by which these tools are developed, the priority tiers are identified, how surface conditions are evaluated. And then um, the plan is, even if the data in the plan um, becomes obsolete over time, the methodology is not, and it becomes easier to still use that methodology to update the information in the web tool. Um, in terms of where Sandoval County can go from here, though, it, this becomes an ongoing process. And so it does require in, ongoing efforts to, to take this kind of concepts and then continue to carry them forward and make them useful over time. So the priority tiers, as I mentioned, uh, I know I'm repeating myself, but the priority tiers don't change over time, but the conditions information does. And those pieces can then be used to create um, priority project lists on an annual or biannual basis. Um, there is a need for updating the GIS conditions and the underlying information that, that informs the priority tier levels or the surface conditions information. Um, but that really is an opportunity because it just means you've got a platform to bring in uh, more data over time. So I'm going to turn it over at this point to Curtis to talk about um, an application in a very different context um, where um, the sort of rural dynamics are replaced by much more of a um, an urban setting with a, an entirely different set of users. So Curtis, go ahead. Thanks, Aaron. Um, as again, I'm Curtis Sanders. And uh, despite being uh, go, a UNM Lobo for both my degrees, they let me work on the NMSU Transportation Asset Management Plan. And this uh, document is uh, very informative because as Aaron said, it shows the way that this asset management uh, process and the methodology and the way it can be applied to a campus scale and a scale entirely uh, different than something like a county. But uh, this also benefited from having a totally uh, additional benefit in that it also looked at ADA compliance and sidewalk conditions that in addition to pavement conditions. So we were able to provide a document that had five uh, key products 
uh, priority tiers based on established criteria, pavement conditions, sidewalk conditions, cost estimates based on those observed conditions that they can then use to prioritize projects, and then an online GIS planning tool as with Sandoval County. Um, as with Sandoval County, our general approach is to create a toolkit rather than just a list of uh, projects that they could tick off. And we wanted to create something that could live on even if the conditions change. And as I already said, uh, this is a combination of priority tiers, cost estimates, and conditions information ultimately. Okay. Um, where these are unique as a campus setting comes into the establishing the priority tiers where you have to find uh, evaluation criteria that fit what the transportation network of a university need. And ultimately these were six uh, criteria that we had established. Um, access to the external city of Las Cruces network and how a road on campus played in the overall roadway network, access to major buildings on campus and on campus facilities uh, like sports uh, stadia, um, access to parking, access to transit, if it had any existing uh, bicycle or multimodal facilities, and then uh, the role that the street played in the overall campus circulate. Uh, circulation and connectivity and the role it plays within the campus roadway network, not just the city network. So after uh, establishing initial uh, scores, which created a baseline of uh, these priority tiers, we then looked at those tiers and made sure that they made sense. And we created a uh, smoothing process that allowed for some uh, context to go in so that we created priority tiers that matched uh, the vision for the overall roadway network. We can go. Um, those of you familiar with New Mexico State, and sadly we're not there to go tour firsthand. Um, some of the tier one real roadways that came uh, from this approach were the Arrowhead Drive, College Drive, Greg Street, Espina, Stewart, and Wells. Um, those are the main, many of those are the main streets of the campus, so it's not much of a surprise to know that they got this tier one designation. And then some of the tier uh, two roadways, which you can see in the lighter maroon color, sort of create the inner circulation network of the campus. Um, going to a little bit of how the sausage is made, um, our evaluation process was based around three guiding documents. Um, the first was the last master uh, plan for transportation for parking services for the campus, which is the last de facto TAMP and asset management plan for the university. So we wanted to build upon that and make sure that our plan wasn't in conflict with the goals and vision established and the work already done by the campus and the planners before us. Um, after that, lots of, uh, it was standard methodology for ADA compliance, the guided ADA standards um, from the American uh, United States Access Board and then the PACER Absile Roads Manual, which I'm sure many in this crowd are familiar with which uh, shows you how to evaluate different uh, pavement conditions and stresses to create a evaluation methodology. So then we used a combination of GIS and Google Earth to evaluate conditions for both sidewalks, curb ramps, and roadways. And we started creating an inventory where we could uh, begin creating the web tool out of this GIS inventory. Um, here's a few examples, some roadways on campus to show the different types of conditions. Um, there's Greg Street on the top left, which is poor. You can see some alligator cracking already taking place and big block cracking. Um, Locust in the middle is fair. You can see some existing work's been done, but the patching is starting to fail and cracks are starting to take place. And then John Loveland added in the bottom right is good and fresh new roadway, which has no cracks that you can be seen. Um, we used uh, this rating system to create a condensed rating system to just create a good, fair, poor methodology. Good roadways were new or recently resurfaced. They had little rutting or cracks and they're fairly easy to see um, and they only need simple maintenance, if any at all. Fair roadways were where cracks were beginning to show themselves transverse and longitudinal cracking, but there was no alligator cracking or anything where the subsurface is beginning to uh, fail. And then poor roadways are where you see those severe crackings, which are elevator cracking, uh, big physical deformities where potholes and other major surface losses present. Get one. So the NMSU roadway system is comprised of both roads owned and operated by NMSU, as well as some of the city roads that uh, 
bisect and go around the campus. And looking at those, you can get a snapshot of the kind of conditions that were seen in this uh, survey. The majority fell into this fair, poor, or poor category. So there's a lot of uh, work to be done on the campus as it stands now. And this survey is the first step of sort of evaluating where those uh, high need areas are. Um, here's a visual snapshot of the conditions we observed during this survey. You can see uh, lots of the, oops, lots of the poor roads are just sort of the smaller ones that don't get them as maintained as some of the tier one roadways that you can line up over place. But next slide. In addition to um, roadways, this is also done to do ADA compliance just because NSU is a public entity and as such, it has to ensure that it is in compliance and make sure that its assets are in compliance with uh, all the latest ADA regulations. So as we were going through and evaluating roadways, we we're also looking at curb ramps and crosswalks. Um, in doing the same sort of good, fair, poor evaluation, um, goods being brand new with uh, all the latest treatments, um, FAIR being one where you can see cracks and deformities present that might start to interfere with use and poor being where there's cracks and deformities present that definitely would interfere with uh, someone operating with a wheelchair or something like that. Here's a few examples of some of the types of curb ramps we saw. Um, top left at Avenue D, which was a Curb ramps that was built in good condition and had proper slopes, but it was just missing a warning surface, which is one of the criteria we look for. Uh, Stanley Drive, there was no uh, curb ramp entirely, so that obviously doesn't comply. And then MacArthur Drive, you see an outdated style of curb ramp where the slope and um, slope doesn't comply, um, it doesn't have warning surface, and there's also some conditions that are starting to fade. So with that uh, same sort of survey, we could put that in GIS and start to visualize it and use it as a tool. And in terms of a snapshot of sidewalks, um, most of them were actually in uh, ADA compliance. And the ones that weren't either did not have a sidewalk or did not have the proper width of sidewalk at the sidewalk that was there. So it's just something that can be used as they identify roadway projects. Um, this can also be done in conjunction to identify where sidewalk improvements can be done to sort of do two birds with one stone and get ADA compliance in addition to roadway improvements. Um, in terms of curb ramps, this is also, those are the dots on the screen. Um, this is much uh, more in terms of scope of what will need to be done to replace it, but uh, you can see just in terms of the kind of evaluation we've done, how much actually needs to be done uh, to comply with ADA ultimately. And this can be a, a first step in sort of uh, programming how this uh, large daunting task can be taken on. Um, we also looked at in terms of just surveying which uh, ramps, in terms of which intersections needed curb ramps at all and which ones had the proper amount. And so this is, that data visualized. One of the other uh, major parts of this plan that we wanted to do include that was going to help with the planning process in terms of allocation of funding was some cost estimates in terms of we're providing this paving condition, but we want to provide also a way where we can get rough cost estimates to determine the types of funding needed for improvement projects in addition to what can be done with existing funding. So this is a uh, simplified table of the rough cost estimates based on uh, some of our existing projects we've had as a company and um, NMDOT bid amounts. And so we have these cost estimates for the type of improvements that coincide with the pavement ratings that we've identified and using those, we can begin to create uh, cost estimates based on the square yardage of the roadway that is in question. And using that, those cost estimates, we can then determine the level of funding needed to go forward with that type of project. Um, that same type of cost estimates were applied to the ADA um, improvements that we identified in this plan. Um, as well as the sidewalk improvements. Um, 
So these are also the same type of rust estimates we provided in that plan based on whether it was square yardage or unit uh, individual units. Um, but once again, this goes, goes into any type of cost estimates needed for an individual project. And then additionally, there are some miscellaneous costs that always uh, coincide with roadway improvement projects. So it would be remiss if we didn't have an estimate of what these would uh, also go for in any type of improvement project. So these were also included in the cost estimates. These include things like uh, traffic control materials, construction staking, and uh, just sort of miscellaneous items that go into the type of improvement projects that are done. Here's an example cost estimate of Locust Street um, that was identified as being in poor condition, but uh, it has a total length of about 1,300 feet by 44 feet. And again, using all those various cost estimates, we created a final um, rough estimate of $196,000. So using that, they can uh, begin identifying what types of projects are the best use of uh, university funds. As with Sandoval County, we created a online web tool that is meant to be uh, interactive for county or not county, uh, university staff and um, the general public. So it's meant to be easily accessible to display the data collected and the uh, priority tiers established within this plan. Um, here's a few screenshots of when you uh, click on this tool, um, you get an overview of the plan. It provides some reference links in case uh, you want to learn more. But then on each tab, you can begin going through and viewing the individual uh, data based on the priority tiers, the pavement condition, the sidewalk conditions, curb ramps. So you can find if you had a particular interest in a curb that you thought was a hazard, you could make sure that it is uh, in this plan or you can begin identifying it uh, using this data. So as with uh, Senegal County, this is meant to be a living document of sorts and uh, it's best whenever there's ongoing efforts that build upon the data and it doesn't just live as one static uh, entity. So ongoing evaluations of roadway and SIO conditions gonna be needed to track that data and see how uh, allocation and asset management efforts have been working so far. Um, there has to be consideration of new infrastructure types and transportation modes as we go forward into uh, more electric vehicles, more uh, electric scooters and that they've already been encountering on campus and just uh, new frontiers in terms of technology that we don't know yet that have to be incorporated into the technology uh, transportation network. Um, in addition to uh, ongoing maintenance of the web tool itself, uh, it also needs work to be the best tool it can be. And so updating that data and making sure that it uh, includes some of the new additions to the campus, like the uh, new roadway projects that are going on with the highway and the off ramps that are gonna be on campus now and ensuring that those are taken into account in the update. I'm just gonna go forward. Did you want to show the other one? Yeah, that's fine. Um, but with that, I'll pass it back over to Mies and she can sort of wrap up our presentation. We can move on to some of the question and answer. So oh, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Curtis, and thank you to the audience for giving us a chance to um, really share the value of integrating a planning lens into asset management. Um, they did a great job sort of highlighting those benefits and a quick summary here, um, which, you know, was well represented by those case studies is this concept of going beyond the, the data collection, the single point of time document and really creating tools and methodologies um, that the communities and agencies can use themselves. Um, we leave them set up to continue with this effort on their own. Obviously, we're here to help them, but to be able to do that internally um, going forth. Again, emphasizing the concept of a holistic approach where, you know, it's built, the criteria are built specific to each community and it can include land use, economic development, all kinds of things that really matter to that community specifically. And, and finally, leaving them with data that is accessible, you know, visual, easy to use um, and beneficial both to the public and to the decision makers. 
So beyond that, and we did, we touched on it a little bit, but we didn't emphasize it too much in those case studies, is this concept of financial scenario planning, um, which we can we also do in cases um, at when it makes sense. And it goes beyond just building the cost estimates, but really trying to look at um, sort of that revenue um, generation scenario, sort of the different types of money and how to bring value and capitalize on that, um, integrating land use opportunities such as public private um, partnerships, um, opportunities to that, and, you know, in the big picture, being able to manage that short-term and long-term phasing as it aligns directly with not just the need or the cost, but also the re revenue generating scenarios around that. So with that, um, we'll, we are done with our presentation, but certainly are here to um, answer any questions that you may have or um, any other, you know, things that we can go over with you. Thank you. And I think you're supposed to put them in the chat, so I'll watch the chat box carefully. And if we don't get any questions, then we do have some to share, so <laughs> we're going to pop those over and see if anybody is uh, interested or willing to answer some of the questions that we brought to the table just to keep the discussion going. And if we have any agencies or any example um, um, projects people have worked on, if they want to share some of the factors that inform the decision making um, in any of the communities you've worked with or work for, that would be really helpful to us and interesting to everybody maybe. Or feel free to answer any of those questions. Do you have any special techniques that you use to apply asset management data? Um, you know, do you consider what time frames around your um, asset management? Is it a, is it five year, ten year, twenty year? Anything that any questions or any discussion items we can bring up. Guys are quiet group today. Denise, I'm going to ask you a question in the absence of questions from the audience. Great. <laughs> Have you noticed any differences in methodologies or approaches in cities and counties in Colorado versus in New Mexico? So the one big difference is that New Mexico does a really awesome job of building the capital improvement programs. And that is a structure that is in place um, and has a real foundation around it. That isn't uh, absolute in Colorado. Some communities do it, some communities don't do it. It just looks a little bit different. And I think with that, um, you sort of lose sort of the continuity of the, um, the and the connection with the asset management program, the value you get from a capital improvement program as it ties to asset management. So that's one of the challenges I see. You guys are pretty quiet. I mean, you can ask other questions. We can talk about sports. We can talk about the weather. Although if you're asking me about sports, I have nothing to offer, but, <laughs> and that may be true about Curtis and Aaron as well. I don't know, but. <laughs> so. My name is Catherine McCullough with WSP. I'll just say, um, I don't have a question, but uh, um, this has been one of the more in, in engaging um, uh, presentations that I've seen so far at the conference. So I just want to thank you guys for the time and effort you put into that. And it's uh, really interesting work you've been doing in the communities. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Well, everyone know, anybody who knows me knows that silence is very challenging for me. So <laughs> something to say. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> I 
So we have a question. Any automated data collection? I think that's a that's a it's a good topic. We challenge we we struggle with that. Yeah, I'll just speak to the fact that um, this, for those, let me guys just say for those two examples, the, the, the short answer is no. Um, and, it, and that's obviously a, a desirable thing to do if we can move in that direction. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that we tried to speak to is how do we apply, uh, how do we utilize or operationalize the data that is available within these different communities? And um, in a lot of cases, we're working with communities that don't kind of resources or that want to make the most out of the data that they already have. So, um, you know, where we have the opportunity to build out automated data collection processes, I think that's a great thing to aspire to. But um, I think one of the things that we've hopefully been able to demonstrate, though, is that there are still ways to take um, imperfect data and turn them into meaningful um, decision making tools. So um, I guess I'll just, you know, leave it by saying that it's great to know it's, it's great to apply, there's always opportunities to improve the methodologies over time. So the other thing, so whatever we've done so far is not sort of static and it doesn't have to be the way that we always apply or evaluate conditions. Um, so the short answer for those projects, no, but we look to do that in the future. The follow-up question, Erin, was, um, is there any deterioration modeling done? Not for those two projects, but that would be a logical next step to apply deterioration models along with the cost estimates, the kind that Curtis provided um, for NMSU. I know that NMDOT does that kind of work in their transportation asset management um, planning. It's a nice, it's a logical next step, especially when it comes to thinking about how do we apply um, maintenance or improvement efforts proactively to sort of stave off the deterioration. And then Catherine was mentioning that she was listening to another presentation related to drone capabilities, um, and they've been used a lot in survey and construction inspection. And have then they be, have they been used to support asset management as well, including conditions assessment? Um, not again for those two examples, but I certainly think that that would make a lot of sense going forward. That would probably be more efficient. That would probably reduce the risk that um, Curtis or people in the field get stuck in, in really precarious situations. So I see a lot of benefits from utilizing those kind of tools. And we definitely use those, um, for asset management on a little bit different, more detailed level. So the work that we do with asset management does live pretty closely to the planning, um, component and the planning level analysis piece. So absolutely the, the drone works, um, well with the more detailed analysis. Yeah, and, I, and I'll say, I mean, we haven't used those specifically for asset management, but we've also used drone footage increasingly for things like corridor studies and looking at pedestrian travel behavior. Um, there's a lot of applications and um, I think surface conditions could be one of them for sure. So you've made the data available to the public through web platforms. Any thoughts on creating a way for the public to submit images and locations to report issues? I think that's a terrific idea. We did actually explore that, not the images so much as um, the conditions data and, and a connection to the quantity of public comments on Sandoval County um, at the very beginning. But it was very challenging to make that connection between sort of the asset management database and the um, public facing comment collection database, but I think that if we could do that in some realm, that would be a, you know, a good solution. Curtis, go ahead too. I was going to say, we've done a similar project that was related to biking that had, oh, did, uh, it was a similar web tool that allowed for comments to be pinned and pictures to be placed. Uh, they just identified specific gaps in the bike uh, network. So that same approach could apply to this in the next sort of update of the web tool, if that's where they wanted to go with that. Sure. And that's a good example too, Curtis, of a, I mean, that's a really kind of a, a information gathering tool that we've used for public outreach, but that kind of you know, apply that same sort of concept or technique for, for gathering more technical data, like surface conditions information.
Good job, you guys. You asked some questions. That's excellent. We'll give a few more quiet moments here in case there's any more coming in. But in the meantime, I hope everyone's been enjoying the conference. It is unfortunate that we can't all be together um, anyone next year. Yeah, anyone who's actually in Las Cruces, please eat some El Sombrero Salsa for me. <laughs> okay, well. I feel like, um, oh, there you go. We are concluded, good. It didn't have to be my decision, this is excellent. So I hope you all have a lovely afternoon and evening and um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all. Uh, so now we're gonna conclude it, yeah, for the track one, Innovative Techniques for Managing Transportation Assets. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna continue at 8 a.m for the exploration of vendor booths and exhibit booths. Um, at 9 a.m., we're also gonna start with the poster, the student poster competition. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, leave an email on the email that's listed in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Curtis. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>